There was a battle for your soul to not be in this place today. I believe that. Some of y'all could have felt like, oh, I... Pastor, understand, I, I need my rest today. But you got up anyway. Come on now. Now, this is not the time to go to sleep, by the way. <laughs> this is the time. Let me, let me speak something to you. Acts chapter 20. We've been on this, uh, this passage last week as well. And I want to read, if you'll go down with me, to um, verse number 22, if you would. And this is Paul sharing with the Ephesian brothers and the leaders where God has taken him to. We've talked about living your life for maximum impact. And Paul has shared some phenomenal things in this passage. And I'm on last week, uh, if you missed last week, you need to see it, um, get the video, uh, watch it on uh, YouTube. And we do welcome everybody watching by live stream this morning. Paul's heart was that not only he, but also his life would be an impact so others' lives would be impact on people's hearts and people's lives for people to come into the kingdom of God. And verse 22 says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. But however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he says, therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you in the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, that savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, the church, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So notice, notice very clearly verse 31. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped what warning each of you night and day. And notice how he says it with tears. He said, now I'll commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are satisfied. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What Grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would enable me to preach exactly how you want me to preach this morning. To say exactly what you want me to say. And to hold within what you don't want shared from my heart. God, help me to say the words that you've placed within for this appointed moment. God, I believe your word that he is, has been revealed to us in Acts 20 is for this day. God, would you touch hearts in a way. God, I pray souls say, I pray lives never be the same after this service today. And we give you all the praise. Thank you for your anointing. God, cleanse us from, from everything that has attacked us, every sin, every doubt, every, every issue that has controlled us. God, we release it to you today. And we give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week... Oh, it was such a fun day. Last week, I got to share and begin this thought. And I've been, as y'all know, I've been on Acts 20 for many, many months now. Or Act, Act, the book of Acts, I should say. But Acts 20, we, we've arrived here. And we talked about the different things that Paul had done and that concerning um, 
Paul spending three years of his life in the city of Ephesus, and he established a local church and won many people to Christ. And these people were very dear to his heart. They were very special to his life. And so he discipled them, and he spent the time with them. And so on his way to Jerusalem, Paul stopped at Miletus, and he he had a a message for the Ephesian elders, or the pastors wanted them to meet him there. So just, I I know I shared this last week, but it just kind of gets us back to in one frame here. And so Paul himself, he knew that this probably would be the last time he would ever see these men. And so what would be his last words? What would he share with them? If he was never going to see them again, what would he say to them to encourage them? See, Paul had had lived among them for all these years, and his life was an open book. And so he was able to look back and review this godly pattern that he had said and because he lived his life for maximum impact. Let me tell you, if you're a child of God, live it. Be, ex- be excited about it. If you're a child of God, give it everything you got. Now, that's a word right there. Live it with the most utmost commitment and, and hunger for more of Jesus and, and hunger to impact people's lives because that's therein why God saved us, that we might reach others with the gospel. We are his ambassadors, as Scripture says. As I shared last week, that word impact, it means having a strong effect on someone. In other words, influence. So my question to all of us today is, who are you influencing? Who has God placed in your life to have an impact on? Let me tell you, we're all influencers. Every one of us have somebody. I'm not talking about having leadership over. Leaders are not the only ones that are influencers. Every one of us are influencers because how many understand the fact we've been influenced by other people? Now, we could probably readily say some that we've been influenced by are our parents or our uh, Sunday school teachers or our pastors or uh, our teachers in school. They're, they have an influence on us. Husbands influence their wives, wives influence their husbands, uh, families, parents with their kids. Influence, impact is an incredible uh, opportunity of God to, to influence in the right way. I mean, you know, Scripture does say, as a man thinks in his heart, what? So I ask you, what's coming out of you? Because one way or the other, you're going to influence either for the good or the bad. What's coming out? So out of this Scripture, we see several things that Paul put on a level that would change people's lives. And one of those things was to be an encourager. And we talked about that last week, encouraging people. How many has been encouraged this week? Amen? How many has encouraged this week? Amen? We were in uh, Publix this past week, and um, this particular uh, young lady, to be honest with you, I cannot say that I remember it every time that I've gone in there and I've seen her. And uh, so we walked, Cheryl and I, we walked in the uh, checkout line, and, and she said, I've seen you, but I've not seen you, to my wife. And, she's, and she was just bubbly. She was excited. And she said, and she was a talker, and she says it about it. I can't remember exactly how she put it. But she was just talking, and, and, you know, I thought about what I preached just, just previously on, that, on last Sunday about being an encourager. And uh, it doesn't take much to encourage. Come on now. It doesn't take much to encourage. It doesn't take long to encourage somebody. I get it. We get in our own little world. We want to get out of there. We want to get out of Walmart, and we want to get out of whatever. We want to get out of church. We want to dart straight to our cars. We don't want to talk to anybody sometimes. It doesn't take much to encourage, because I'm telling you, Jesus took the time to encourage us. Amen. Amen. I read, I was, uh, and I'm not going to go back and preach through this. I preached a, a good amount of time last week on this one thought. But I, I was looking on, I, was, I thought about this book on my, uh, that I had. Anybody familiar with John Maxwell? I, lo- I love John Maxwell. He's, he is a guru of leadership, not just uh, Christian-wise, which he is a very strong Christian, has been a pastor for many years. He's not now, but he's, he's secularly, he is very well known for his leadership ability. 
But I, I looked at this uh, just briefly before, I, and, I, and I just bought it. I didn't have time to put it in my notes, so I just thought I'd bring the book. It's called, I picked this up several years ago at, at an airport uh, bookstore. And so I wanted, I wanted to share it with you this morning. Mark Twain said this way. He said, keep away from people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that, but the really great make you feel that you too can become great. Not do we want just to be great ourselves, we want others to become great. Isn't that just like Jesus? Maxwell also said, we tend to become what the most important person in your life thinks we will become. If you discourage, guess what people are going to feel all the time? I'm just going to let that lay out there for a moment. So he said, how to become an encourager. Number one, appreciate the power of encouragement. It's oxygen for the soul. Two, believe in people. If you don't believe in people, they won't believe you. Number three, build relationships. The closer you are, the more encouragement counts. Number four, walk your talk. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Model first what you would encourage others to do. Don't be encouraging others to do something that you don't do yourself. Uh, That's just just a thought there. Show people you think they're important. You know one of the key things that encourages people, and I, I think we all struggle with this, how many, okay, this is going to take getting, don't think you're prideful by, by at, at answering in the affirmative here. So it's okay to answer truthfully what I'm about to say. How many loves to hear somebody call your name? How many would rather be called by your name than somebody than a name that's not your name? In other, in other words, it's really not a good thing when I'm here in front of Sister Graciela. Hey, Jane, how are you today? <laughs> Thank you. What she said. <laughs> Basically said her, her number, say it. Name in Spanish is? Nombre, thank you very much for all you talented people. I wish I could. Nombre, she basically said her her name is Graciela. Now, here's my point. Have you ever been in a place where you had people beside you come up and you were talking to them and you could not for the life of them remember their names, then somebody else came up and you did try to introduce them and you said, this is my wife Cheryl. And then that's all you say. And you're waiting for them to say, oh, my name is. See, we've all been there. Remembering people's names is one of the greatest things of encouragement. Now, what does that have to do with the message this morning? Everything. Yes, I know God knows our name. But the point is, avenues that we have influence on people's lives, it means we take are taking the time to know somebody. I understand in our positions as leaders at times we, we have a lot of people all week trying to remember people's names, and, and, and I know we all have grace for people, and I know we've called people names that they're not names, <laughs> and we missed it. But Maxwell said it this way. He said, he said, show people you think they're important, remember their names, and ask for help. And lastly, give people a reputation to uphold. People rise to our level of expectations. The best way to cheer, the best way to cheer yourself up is to cheer everybody else up. You want to be encouraged? Then encourage somebody else. Amen? That's good stuff. That's just good stuff. And so that's one of the areas that, as Paul said in verse number, chapter number 20, verse 1, he encouraged them. Verse number 1, he said, Paul sent for his disciples, and after encouraging them, folks, encouraging each other in the Lord. And sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. 
When there's no one else, there's no excuse, we encourage ourselves in the Lord. Paul, the writer to Hebrews says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the sinful God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So what I get from that is that my encouragement can can keep people from indulging in the deceitfulness of sin. And I'm saying on an ongoing basis, encouraging them. So one of them is, is encourage others. Secondly, we talked about be committed to the church. What a powerful statement. We need the house of God. We need each other. Well, understand that a vertical and horizontal dimension goes together and our gathering together. Because when we are vertically right with God, it causes us to be vertically, uh, horizontally right with people. We have a vertical relationship, but because of a vertical relationship with Jesus, God has exposed us to horizontal relationship with people. We need each other. Being here today encourages me. It encourages you being here today. It encourages others. God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We talked about being committed to the church. I'm not going to preach that anymore. I, well, I will be keep, keep preaching that, yes. But in this message this morning, thirdly, is where I want to get to. We all know the scripture that Paul said, I have kept the faith. I finished the race. And we see these thoughts and lines of, of his heart in this passage in Acts 20. Verse 22, he says, And see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me. Wow. Let me tell you, I want to encourage you this morning, finish the race that God has placed you on. Don't be a quitter. Be a finisher. Finish the race. Someone shout it with me. Finish the race. Look at somebody and say, finish the race. Don't stop. It is easy to get uh, 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 to the point where we're discouraged and where we don't feel like it's worth it going on, but God has placed us on a race. Finish the race. All these things that will try to stop you, Paul said, none of these things move me. See, Paul's main concern was not preserving his own life. What counted most was that he wanted to finish the work to which God had called him because wherever and however it ended, even if it cost him his life, he would finish his course with joy. And don't finish the race with a sad face. Finish the race with the joy of the Lord changing your life. Let me tell you, I want to encourage you with this thought. It's worth it all to serve Jesus. It's worth it all to keep on, as someone said years ago, keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Don't stop before God calls you home. Hold on to what God has placed in your life. You see, Paul was saying life and service for Christ are represented as a race that must run with absolute perseverance, endurance, and faithfulness. And I want to take you to three scriptures if you'll go with me. And I'm going to, I'm going to first invite you to go with me to 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Paul shares something very strong here. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Would you look there with me? It says, do you not know that in a race all the runners, everyone, they run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. It's kind of like, how many played baseball or softball in high school or whatever? You know, or you watch them playing on TV. You know, the coach would say, run it out. Even if you had a ground ball and they were gonna throw you out, don't just stop running halfway down. Run it out to first base. Run it with everything you got. Let me tell you, it may look bad. It may look like you're gonna be thrown out, but run it out. God's got a plan for your life. Finish the race. Don't give up. He goes on to say, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Come on, finish 
the race. Go with me to 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4 and verse number 7. 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse number 7. Paul says it this way to his son in the faith. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Say it with me. I have finished the race. I have finished the race. What I've begun, I have finished the race. I've not stopped. I have finished the race. I didn't just start. Folks, it's not that you start well, it's that you finish well. Starting well is great, but those that go across the finish line, those that see the Savior one day and hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joys of the Lord. Starting is great. Starting is awesome, but God is looking for finishers. It's not easy to finish. It's not easy to deal with the stuff that causes you to, to continue uh, uh, on. And, and it, it's not easy to, to be one that goes on the finish line. There are those in this room this morning, you have abilities that I don't. You are runners. I look at one of my dear friends in the back that is a, a competent runner, Danny. woo Danny is trained. Danny didn't get up one day and say, Millie, I'm going to run that marathon tomorrow. He would not have finished. He would, he would have died. Seemingly. My friend trained. He is trained. He got his body in shape. He got the right shoes. He puts on the right clothing. I mean, understand you don't run a marathon with a parka. He had the right hat on or whatever, the band, whatever. He's got water, those on the, on the side. He's got the support of his family and his church and his pastor. Yeah, yeah. And aren't you about to run a marathon? He's about to run a half marathon. How many miles is that? Tell me one more time. 13 miles. It's ungodly. God didn't call me to run that race. I'll run something else, but God didn't call me to run that race. But my brother has trained. I have seen his body change. He's lost an incredible amount of weight preparing. He has, I have heard, and have seen God did a miracle, a physical miracle in him, breathing in his lungs to be able to run that race. Let me tell you, number one, if there's a determination to do something, then you back it up. You know, I can be determined all day long, but if I've got to have the, the stamina and the hunger to do something, if you're hungering to see Jesus one day, then you've got to have the stamina to keep going on. You've got to make the decision, I'm not going to stop when I run out of that first thing. Danny just kept running. He's going to keep running at marathon. And he don't just start. Him and, and I know uh, Manuel has done it too. They've run the, the bridge. Let me tell you, that's an ungodly bridge. <laughs> you know what I did? I, I promise you this. I did it. No, I did not run. No, I didn't know. I tell y'all, I'd, I'd, I'd probably tell you, I ran the bridge. I, I tell you. No, I, I took my bike out there. This has been years ago. God delivered me. I had never done it again. I tried to ride my bike up that bridge. I got that puppy out. I got off that thing, and I walked it up there because it was killer. I'll get on my treadmill and run low. I <laughs> no, I walk low. Thank you very much. Here's my point. He trained. If you want to make it to the end, there's some things that you've got to go through to be able to get to the end. 
you've got to be able to face temptations. You've got to be able to face discouragement. You've got to be able to face trials that hit you. You've got to be able to face the onslaught of the demonic. You've got to be able to face some things that's going to try to trip you up. That's why Paul later says, be on your guard. You've got to be able to have the attitude that says, no matter what devil may say, no matter what anything else may happen, I've got my prize ready for me because I'm going to finish the race. Finishers are those that keep the prize in mind. Paul said, I've not arrived yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. Racers don't race with their back towards the finish line. Racers don't look back. Racers look forward. Runners look forward. Finishers look forward. Finishers know there's something greater. There's an achievement. There's a level of achievement that not everybody gets there. Not everybody's going to go through the narrow gate. Not everybody's going to go through that finish line. But those that do, Paul, or or, uh, the gospels, Jesus Christ uh, shares with us that he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. Paul said, I fought a good fight. He said, I finished the race. Say with me, finished And I have kept the faith. He didn't just finish the race and being mad about it. He finished the race. Well, it wasn't easy and I'm just sick about it because nobody else understood me, but I'm going to finish it anyway. No, he finished the race with joy. He finished the race with competence. He finished the race with the power of the Spirit of God in him. I mean, there are some Christians you wonder because they're always mad. They're always mean. They've always got a scowl on their face. Come on. If you're walking with Jesus, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Come on. That's going to help you finish the race. It's going to be hard to finish the race with a scowl. Oh, come on now. Be encouraged in the Lord. Finish the race with joy. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's trying, but be a finisher. Paul said it, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you would carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Go with me to Hebrews 12, 1, the third scripture. Shout with me, I'm a finisher. Come on, shout it with me, I'm a finisher. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 12 of Hebrews, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders And the sin that so easily entangles and let us, what? Run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. My race may be different from yours, but God has marked a race out for us. God has given us the ability God has marked out a plan, and so we, how do we do this? He says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the prize. He's the author and the finisher, our perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. But God says, Paul said through the anointing of the Spirit of God, he said there's a cloud of people, witnesses already in the glories of heaven, and they're shouting out praise. They're shouting out. They're shouting out Holy Ghost encouragement. They are witnesses of what we're going through. You know, we're not in the church there yet, heaven-wise, that we're in the glories of heaven, but isn't it awesome what we should be? We should be just like those witnesses, cheering on our brothers and sisters in the Lord, says, you're going to make it. Come on. You can do it. Instead of saying, oh, I knew he'd fall. I knew he'd mess up. Come on, be a finisher. I look at Sister Alice, choose to live. You're a finisher, lady of the Lord. You're a finisher, Bernie. You're a finisher in the house of God. We didn't just start and let little problems affect us, big problems, and say, well, now I got reason to stop. No, we're finishers. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He said, I'm a finisher. Every person should aim to finish strong. We got to persevere because confidence will be rewarded. Obedience will be recognized. Shrinking back will be regretted. And Christ's return will be celebrated. So our journey, it's not a sprint. It is a marathon. And we've got to pace ourselves and endure to the end. Let me tell you, finishing strong does not just happen. There's a finish line. And God says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You got to stand firm. You got to finish this race. And it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so, how are you going to finish? Where will you end your life with God? 
Scripture tells us this in Galatians 6, 8, and 9. He says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Danny, if you listen to your flesh, you would never finish, would you? Because that flesh starts, that heart starts beating, and that you get tired, but then you get your second wind and third wind and 20,000th wind, I don't know. But God says on the opposite spectrum, he said, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. And here it is, this kicker, verse number nine. He said, let's not get tired of doing what is good. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. The writer said in the King James Version, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of doing the right stuff. Come on, men of God and women of God. Don't get tired doing what's right. Don't get tired serving God. When your flesh wants to give up and you're dying on the inside and Satan has said, you might as well give up. Don't stop doing what is right. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on enjoying God. Come on, get back to enjoying the presence of God. Keep on letting the light shine in you and from you. Keep on. I know there's a lot of hell coming against you. I know there's a lot of demonic attack. I know we live in a land where the world is being turned upside down by the demonic uh, uh, propulsion of the demonic uh, junk and uh, the devil's own theology. But I'm telling you, they that hang on and that said, I won't stop you're going to be rewarded. I know there's some stuff happening right now in the world, in our lives, in the church. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, hang on. I've come to give you life and that life more abundantly. Somebody ought to finish the race. Somebody ought to finish the race. He says, because at just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Number four, to be an impact person, live a life with no regrets. I said, Pastor, you've lost me there. I already got regrets. We all got regrets. So how do I live from here with a life with no regrets? Verse 22 through 24 of Acts 20, if you'll go back there with me. Paul began to share with the Ephesus leaders. He said, you know how I've taught you. You know my life. You know what I've shared by not just words, but I've shared it. I've lived it before you. And he said, I understand you're not going to see me again because God is compelling me to go to Jerusalem. And, and of course, ultimately, he would give his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, verse 27, I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. He said, I've lived my life before you, and I've, my conscience is pure. Basically saying, I have no regrets. I've done what God called me to do. He said, verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Key words there is the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Everybody in this room, I want you to hear this pastor this morning, everybody in this room that are children of the Most High God, sons and daughters of God, God has given you the task of testifying to the grace of God. Let me say it again. Everybody in this room, everybody has been given the task of testifying to the grace of God. So Paul committed his life to Christ and often found himself doing things that didn't make a lot of sense to the natural mind. But he did it anyway. 
why go back to Jerusalem when he knew that many of the Jews there wanted him dead? Because verse 22 says he was compelled by the Spirit. He was compelled, pushed on by the Spirit of God. Question is today, how well do you like venturing into the unknown? Most of us get rather comfortable in our routines of life and don't welcome the surprises that pop up along the way. And honey, I'm telling you, there's a lot of surprises along the way. Question is, are you committed to following Jesus? Are you willing to part with your plans and the things you rely on for security in order to really follow the Lord? If not, you may pile up some regrets along the way. Let me tell you, one of the greatest regrets, I know we all have sin regrets. We wish we had not done these things, but I'm talking about spiritual regrets that we did not do what God called us to do. You know, here are some things that you probably will never regret. You'll never regret spending quality time with your family. You'll never regret quality time in prayer and reading your Bible. You'll never regret investing in other people's lives so they will know the Lord and grow spiritually. Anything that brings you or someone else closer to God and carrying out His purposes, those are the things you'll never regret. Husbands, You'll never regret loving your wife with all your heart as Jesus loves the church. Did y'all hear Tony? He said amen to that. Debbie's a blessed lady because you're you, man. Yes, you are. I don't remember all the days and all the sermons that I heard growing up in my dad's house, or God's house, but and in my dad's home where I was his son at. I don't remember everything he instructed me to do. I don't remember every message he preached, but I know they were all good. And I never regret being raised in my dad's home. My dad taught me. I never regret, (laughs) I do regret the things I didn't do and should have done. (laughs) Didn't like the spankings. My dad didn't have a problem one by one discipline me. But I don't regret being in his home. I don't regret being in church. I don't regret every time the church doors are open, I was there. That all possible. You know, somebody on their deathbed, I've been there many times to people's lives. I never heard anybody saying, I wish I could have played one more round of golf. Most people wish they could have done more for Jesus. I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong, golf's not not a sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a sin the way I play. (laughs) There's some things we regret. There's some things, though, I don't regret. I don't regret, Megan, those times when you were five and six, seven years old in Millbrook, Alabama, getting out of School on Wednesday afternoons for half a day. Your mom was teaching. And a lot of those Wednesdays we'd go to McDonald's. I don't know if you remember that. I'd take her to lunch. I don't regret those times with my son taking him on the school trips. I remember one trip I got to take with him. We went out to the Camp St. Christopher. And one point of the trip, we had mud all over us. But I got to spend time with my son. 
I don't regret the 36 years that I've got to invest into my wife and her into me. Come December, come November, I've been here almost 16 years as pastor. Don't regret the first time that I came into this house. I don't regret the day at five years old I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Come on, are you with me this morning? I don't regret every time God has spoke something to me. I can't say I've done it every time, but I don't regret saying yes, Lord, and doing what he says. Oh, I've missed it on the other side many times, too many times, those I do regret. Here's the point. In order to encourage somebody else, in order to impact somebody else, you have to be the person that's willing to be impacted by Jesus Christ and do what he calls you to do. How many want to keep doing what is good for him? Would you stand with me? Susan, I just want to, I'm going to ask you to come. That leads me to number five. Sometimes, not just sometimes, has anybody ever spoke truth into you at times that you didn't really like but did it help you? Yeah, I've had that many times. Scripture I know says speaking the truth in love. Now sometimes we speak, we, we, we don't do it in love. <laughs> you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, I want to tell you something in love, it's a pretty good chance that love is the last thing they're going to show you. Because number one, you don't have to tell anybody that you tell them this in love. They'll know it. So here's the point. To be a person of impact, you've got to be able to speak truth in love. Sometimes we shy away from speaking truth to people's lives, warnings about things that aren't right to our children or even as pastors or uh, teachers parents, uh, just people with our friends. But he said, he said, I, I, I know that none of you, verse 25, among the whom I have gone about preach the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. But sometimes you got to speak a word of warning. Sometimes it's not easy to speak the truth to somebody. And that doesn't mean you go out and find all untruth and of what people's doing wrong and then just slam them with the gospel and say, you're wrong. You know, that's, no, you gotta have, you got to have the, the anointing of the Spirit of God. There's sometimes you got to speak. Sometimes you got to just keep your mouth closed. And we learn that. That's when you're dealing with people. Everybody okay? And it's good. But there's sometimes I've had it happen to me. God has set me right when I've had dear friends. I'm thinking of one, out, one example right now from in a previous church. God set me straight through one of my dear friends. Oh, I cried. <laughs> I knew I was wrong. And even to this day, there are things that God has spoke to me through other people. Corrections. Are we willing to be corrected? Pride's a, pride's a devil mountain, isn't it? We get that pride level and we, we think we're beyond correction. I, I'm, I don't want to speak for you. and no, Not that we're beyond it. Sometimes we, and then we, well, we may disagree, but then there are times that God will say, listen. So the question I ask you today is, what are the warnings we need to give our church or our family or our friends or our neighbors? No, not God has not called us to be the spiritual police, but at the same time, we need to warn people about compromises and distractions. God wants to use us. And with love, and God opens a door, we can journey with people and bring loving correction and encouragement. See, admonition and encouragement is not not always necessarily saying that, um, hey, you look great today. Encouragement, it can also have the flavor of encouraging somebody to do good works. 
by saying, hey, there's some things here can we work together on? God didn't call Christians to be sandblasters that we blast everybody, get them cleaned up, no. Because that would kill people. That's why Paul, he had such a knack. He was truthful, but he had such a way of sharing the heart of God. And at the same time, he says, watch out for pretenders. They'll try to massage the gospel and change it to gain people to themselves. Folks, we got we to gotta encourage in the right way. And then the last one, number six, be on your guard. God said it this way. He said, verse 31, he said, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I'll commit you to God. Proverbs 4.23 says it, be on, uh, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Don't let nothing affect your life. Don't let nothing affect your heart. Guard it. Keep it safe. Paul said to the Corinthians in chapter 16, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 1, he said, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Say with me. Be strong. These are some things I believe that will help you to lead a life of maximum impact. And I don't believe we'll ever be the same. Encourage people. Be committed to the church. Finish the race. Live a life with no regrets. Speak the truth. And be on your guard. Would you all agree with that? Come on, let's praise him. Father, I worship you, and I thank you. It's not easy at times being faithful to the race. God, it's not easy at times to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our understanding, because sometimes we, we trust our understanding more than we trust yours. God, that is so wrong. And we find out, though, <laughs> yes, God, we were wrong. You were always right. Father, help us to be on guard and to understand the things as they truly are, the realities of the deceit of this world that can get into our minds and hearts and, and, and have an adverse effect on us. May we be strong in what we know, God, not in our pride, but in faith and trust in you. You've given us opportunity to impact people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To live a life, a daily living of our lives to impact others, wherever that may take us. Whatever relationships those may be. We choose to be people of impact. Beginning with our own selves. That we are impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give you praise. Heads are bowed just a moment. In this room this morning, wherever you may be in your walk with God, I want to I want to speak to you as we close this service. Let me change the order here in a few moments. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to know Him and to give your heart to Him. It's as simple as God said, those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord, died and rose again. God says you're saved. You'll be saved. As we talked a couple of weeks ago from Revelation 3, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open up the door, I'll come in. So I want to ask you this simple question. And I want to pray with you. Pastor, I know Jesus came today. I'm not right. I'm not ready. I want to be right. I want to be ready. I, I, want to, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. If that's you, say, Pastor, would you pray with me? Just Would you acknowledge that today by lifting your hand up real quick, putting it right back down? I just want to lead you in prayer. I want to make sure you're right with God. I'm looking around. I, I want to include you in this prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 
How many is ready to run the race? Ready to run the race? And if you see me running beside you and I'm gasping for rare, Danny, stop and help me, man. Help somebody. Be an encourager. Amen.